So my, my name's Anthony Gladi. I'm the uh, music director here at Never Apart. And today I'm joined with uh, Patty Schmidt from uh, Mutech Montreal. She's uh, been the programmer there for eight years now. And uh, she also hosted uh, a show on CBC Radio called Brave New Waves for 17 years. And uh, we're also joined by our Rose. Um, you, I'm sure if you're here, you know, uh, you know about our Rose. And uh, this is the first public appearance interview um, that our Rose is giving. So I will let uh, Patty take the stage with the, with the questions. Thanks, Anthony. I'd really like to, to welcome uh, our Rose to her first public in persona conversation, and she'll be performing tomorrow night at Equinox, of course. Welcome to Montreal. Thank you for doing this, and thank you for looking so good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> now, uh, last year, I, um, or two years ago when you played at Mutech, I tried to talk you into doing a uh, public conversation, and you thought about it for a really long time, and then I bugged you, and then you said no. <laughs> what changed? Uh, I think it's time passing is part of it. Um, after, I think there's only so long you can go without talking. Um, and uh, there's only so long you can really stay in the shadows. But um, I think I was just drawn to this space as a, uh, as a, space to connect with, and I thought it would be a good chance to, to open up here. Um, I like what the place represents and the feeling I got from it when Anthony introduced it to me. Does it also have something to do with the fact that the anonymity, which was so well preserved for the last few years, has started to unravel a bit? Um, yeah, and that's partly intentional. I've. I've, I've wanted it to sort of relax organically over the years. I didn't, um, I didn't expect to remain anonymous forever. Um, the, the idea was to, to be able to launch a new music project without any preconceptions so that people would encounter it um, as a kind of mysterious object and evaluate it that way. But um, as I appear in public more and more, then... Um, you know, something becomes more tangible about my presence, and um, I don't, I don't want to be a spokesperson. I, I don't like to uh, sort of like broadcast a lot of information on the internet and things like that. But I think there's, at this point, um, there's a, a reason to talk <laughs> about certain things. Did you organize some of the? Um, I, I guess. Not, could be the right word, the collusion with promoters and stuff to also maintain this sort of sense of mystery so that people would yeah, in the well, beginning encounter you. It was, kind of, it was kind of an experiment at the same time. I, I was anonymous, but I also, in some of the short interviews I did, I, I s stated that if people wanted to know more about me and my past, they could approach me privately. I just didn't want people to post information on the internet um, about it, which is kind of a strange request because a lot of people don't even really separate the idea of internet from regular communication now. It's all part of this fluid thing. So to ask people to keep it off the internet is kind of strange or keep it off of public forums. Um, but people were very respectful of that and um, several people did just send me very kind emails asking, you know, some questions and I would answer. I would tell them all about my past work and whatever they asked. And people were very respectful, um, yeah, for several years. Um, and I started to see, you know, little leaks um, pop up and it, it just happened very slowly and it didn't really bother me. I, I figured like the experiment for, for a few years, um, people were, were respectful and didn't really post anything. And I thought that was, that was an accomplishment. <laughs> um, I could relax after that. When I was doing um, some research on this, I sent Anthony the link to, um, and he called it drama in the Discogs forum. And there was somebody who had attached the R. Rose recordings to the, to the Seth Horowitz and Sutek recordings, and someone kept taking them down. And then there was a really angry uh, series of responses from people about, what are you doing? Discogs is supposed to be totally authentic and true, and you, know, you can't do that. Was it you? 
who was erasing it? Um, <laughs> I did it once. Um, I did it once, and I just wrote uh, artists uh, asks not to link their name to this project. But if it happened a bunch of times, it wasn't always me, because I only did it one time. Okay. <laughs> Discogs vint vigilanteism or something. <laughs> And, and now it's up there, and I just, I, I saw that it's there, and I said, that's fine. So, so um, the first encounter that I had with R. Rose, I took that record back to the office at Mutech, and I was like, Alain, we need to like totally book whatever this is. <laughs> and then it was maybe six months later that we found out that it was you, and it was a complete delight that that's how I discovered it, and the music was so great and so unusual and surprising that... Um, this is the question I would have wanted to ask you back then would be, why be Rose? Why be our Rose? Why do that? Why create a persona? What did it offer you? Well, there was a kind of history that led up to that. I, um, I had been making techno music for years and years since the 90s and dipping my foot into other projects and things like that. And I kind of, um, at a certain point, got fed up with it, got sort of decided I was going to learn piano and become a composer. Um, and thought, for several years, I thought that I was sort of leaving club music altogether. Um, ended up going back to school, doing a master's degree in studying mu music theory and electronic music. And in that program, I um, connected with Bob Ostertag, who gave a, a workshop, and he speaks out a lot about technology and its influence in people's lives, and he speaks about music and how our exposure to machines and computers and the generation growing up with that has led to this sort of preference of, of the sort of computer-based pulse, which he can't stand in music. Um, uh, he finds that to be a very negative trait of where music has come, and he's always trying to subvert the idea of a pulse in his music. Um, when I met him, I felt suddenly, even though I, w I had drifted away from club music and techno music and gotten into this other world and thought I was leaving it, I felt suddenly like I had to stand up for techno when I was in this workshop, and so I got into a lot of debates with him about it, and um, eventually sort of dared him to make music with a pulse. And he started making music with the Buchla Modular, which um, he had recently obtained. And he started sending me this stuff and um, asking me, like, OK, is this techno music? Will people dance to this? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, probably not. But I bet I could do something to this that would turned it into techno, and, um, and he was kind of intrigued by that idea, so I ended up remixing these recordings. And that was before I had a new name or a new project, but it was, it was that sort of meeting and that project that inspired me to make techno again. And I thought, like, after this time away from it, it had to be something new. And I was still kind of resistant to the idea of sort of jumping into the techno world again and becoming a techno artist. There are a lot of things about the, the techno world that are kind of problematic for me. Um, partly, I didn't, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to represent um, another sort of boring, nerdy white guy on stage playing techno. I didn't want to be that on stage. And, um, and I also didn't want techno to really be the thing that I do, which um, I wanted it to be sort of a side project or something I do as part of my life, that didn't didn't work because that has now <laughs> become <laughs> most of what I do. But um, but I had these other ways to fulf to fulfill the other aspects of that. So I came up with this name, um, and initially wasn't you know I took the name uh, I borrowed it from Marcel Duchamp, um, the artist who had a female pseudonym, and initially I, I wasn't prepared to dress the role. It kind of crossed my mind, but I, I wasn't really prepared to do it. It just sort of developed over time. I started to perform. I wasn't really sure what to do with my identity, and 
Um, I wore a mask a couple of times and that just seemed to kind of actually reinforce some of the masculinity in a sense and that seemed problematic as well. So I talked to a couple of people. I think it was, well, it was, it was Carl O'Connor Regis who I, I said, you know, he said, stop wearing a mask, don't wear a mask, don't do that. And I said, well, my other idea is to, to become a female and take on that role. And he was like, do that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yes. I think he said, uh, he said, um, do it, go panty Christ on them, which <laughs> is a reference to a Bob Ostertag album by With, that uh, name. Justin so, Bond. Yeah. Yes. So that was basically when I made the decision, I'm going to do this. Well, there's a lot. It's different than alias. It's different than disguise. It becomes embodiment and enactment, and you have to own that in a completely different way. So the shift in thinking, I mean, was it quick, or is it something that you know, is still evolving and that you're thinking about? It's still evolving. I mean, I, when I first decided to do it, I didn't, I wasn't getting booked that often, so I didn't know how much a part of my life it would become. So um, the first time, the first time I, I did it uh, was to open for Jeff Mills in Washington D.C. <laughs> at a small club, and um, I I got some some high-heeled boots that were way too tight for me, and I had my neighbor, who was a makeup artist, do my makeup. Um, and um, I was very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> but um, the more I do it, the more comfortable I get. And the more I do it, the more I think about it, and um, the more a part of my life it becomes. And um, then the less it seems like an act, and then the more it, it seems like a, sort of another side of me, you know? I'm no uh, queer theorist or anything, but a very basic sort of definition of Butler's performativity of gender comes to mind. Um, do you feel that when you're on stage that you are really fully embodying uh, something female? Um, no, I would say I occupy some space in between. Um, um, in between male and female, but also in between who I am in daily life and who I am on stage. It's not, it's not like I am able to completely become a different persona. I'm always sort of aware of it, but it's, uh, it's a kind of melding. Uh, um, it, it seems like a, um, like another side, another side of myself. Um, but I think it's, it, when you talk about performing gender, it's, it's interesting that I just made this choice. It wasn't something that I sort of felt compelled to do as if like biologically I felt like I had to break out of my shell, but it felt necessary for some reason, for some other reason, sort of social reason and some other personal reasons, but not, not like, um, it wasn't um, that, you know, I, I knew I wouldn't be doing this, you know, every day. Uh, th I knew that um, it wasn't something that was sort of calling out from my inner identity it, it was a mixture of other factors, but um, the more I do it, the more it, it actually does become a part of my identity, which is, a, it's, the whole thing is kind of an interesting experiment and, and does make me think a lot about, about my own identity. Uh, sorry, on, on that, I'm just curious how, as you become more comfortable, um, I guess embodying the persona, how that sort of melts into your life, your daily life, as as Seth, and if there's a side of the of the R Rose persona that you feel has been coming out more in just sort of day to day. Um, well, one thing that I think is really fun and fascinating and interesting is that I I have uh, three and a half year old twin daughters and they know what I do for a living, and it's, 
it's really great to talk to them about it and discuss it with them. Um, so when I'm going away for a show, we talk about it and they are um, totally unfazed by the idea that I become a woman when I perform. They think it's pretty cool and um, we talk about what all that means to them and I ask them lots of questions about it and I think it's really great that I can allow them to think about those issues even though they love princesses and fairies and mm -hmm. all the things that little girls love right now. They're also like at the same time totally okay with the idea that they're father can become a woman um, on stage. Mm. What kinds of things have they said that have been interesting to you? Um, just that I'm, they'll like comment, they'll say that I look pretty and like, oh, you look oh, like cute. a girl and, uh, <laughs> and oh, you're, you're gonna wear your makeup and like they're really interested in it all. And, um, cool. and well, one of the things that's funny is um, they, for a while, they decided that girls are always first and everything, like if we're gonna go up the stairs to take a bath or whatever, like I can't be first. But then I say, but what if I'm our Rose? And they say, oh, then you can be first. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about so as it's been five years now, about, mm -hmm. yeah, have you, um, considered what the power is that you now have in this persona? I mean, there's two things, I guess, in this question. There's the idea, first of all, that you were going to be presenting this in a live context, in a performance environment, so you would be with people, and they would be looking at you, and there is often an expectation of the performer's relationship with them. Do you find a power in that? And have you come to maybe play a little bit with some of those things? Yeah, well, part of the, part of the reason I felt I needed to do this is, well, for me, the, the ideal way to present my music, if it were up to me, would be to disappear from stage and just let the sound be what speaks. It's not, it's just not, um, really possible, like audiences can't, in especially when it's uh, dance music, audiences can't really accept an invisible performer, they need somebody there. And, um, and I mean, I do it too when I'm at a show, I stare at the DJ, I find myself doing that. It's just something we do and um, I think, I mean, I notice when I'm playing a show and people are staring at me that it's, it, it seems to like put them in a different state of mind, um, which I think uh, enhances their experience, like allows them to sort of go somewhere with the music too. It sort of says this is, this is a kind of parallel alternative reality we're in now. And that helps, I think that helps people to sort of achieve that state of mind um, when, when they see that um, this person on stage, uh, it, there's, there's something that they don't totally understand about it, you know? It's not oh, the same old thing that you see every day. Disorientation maybe a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, slippage a little. The thing that I was struck, I saw you play um, at Bergheim, which is, you know, temple of macho techno in so many ways, and I was really, um, struck with what a demasculinizing effect your physical presence had on what was happening in the room, too. Mm. Yeah, that's, um, I think in the best circumstances that does, that does happen. Um, I am surprised sometimes when, and there are cases where people come up to me and um, sort of treat me like another bro or something after the, after the performance and <laughs> kind of don't, they don't get it. But um, for the most part, I, I find it really interesting that people do um, change the way they interact with me if they come and talk to me after. Like some really macho guy may be like suddenly really thinking about their words and how they are supposed to talk to somebody you know, like, wait, I can't do the same sort of 
back slapping and like fist bumping that I would <laughs> do with the normal, you know, rockin', rockin' techno dude DJ who gets off of the decks. And um, so it, yeah, it makes people, uh, and usually people are extremely warm um, when they approach me and, um, and respectful. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and people that I don't even expect would uh, say they're really inspired by my, my appearance and by the project and everything. So it's nice to hear. I was just gonna say that what you just said about kind of the context with which people are able to approach you after a show or whatnot, it's, and Patty was also kind of speaking to this as well, as the pretense that you set in the environment, in the club environment, where you know you you start after someone who has had their kind of bro down or whatever you want to call it, and then you kind of like cleanse the palate. I think the the presence of of you know the embodiment like really sets a tone for the rest of the evening for people. And I mean, Patty, I think that's kind of what we were speaking about when we were developing the, these questions: is that people are a bit disoriented, and it's good to feel uncomfortable. And I think in that uncomfortability, people are really able to let go. And I, I mean, in the two prior experiences I've seen you, is like people really like let loose, you know, and, and they're able to yeah, kind of they're, be free. Yeah, they're uncomfortable in one sense, but they're also permitted to be comfortable in other ways. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. that's, it's sort of this, it opens up the doorway to be com Absolutely. comfortable with different realities. You sort of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but that you had gone away from club culture and that it was problematic for you in some ways. What were some of the ways? Um, well, partly that it tends to be so um, male dominated and um, it's so often that I still, that I'll get booked for a show and then get taken out to dinner by a, a, you know, a table full of like techno dudes. Um, and maybe one girlfriend who sits and doesn't say anything, or I might try and engage in conversation, but um, that still happens a lot. It's, that's still very common. Um, um, for me, I, I think I was not enjoying the music very much either after a while, and it's still kind of, I'm not really a party person, and I don't really enjoy staying out all night, so it's kind of a, Oh, it is, yeah, <laughs> there's an irony, and it's kind of a struggle for me, but um, I, I feel like this is the medium that I can communicate best with, and, and there is something about the energy of a crowd at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. Um, or 5 a.m. in, you know, in a club that, um, that is kind of magical, that you don't get in, um, you know, in a seated concert environment, but, um, but, you know, they're different experiences. Do you think now that you've spent so long with the project that there's a way that our rose, the female embodiment, is embodied in the music and in the sound at all? I mean, Anthony we're also, and I were also talking, I was thinking about, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but I mean, there's discussion without really strong theory about it, about, you know, gendered codes in uh, music, or is uh, sound queer? Can it have these kinds of signifiers to it? Um, and a lot of improv or clusters of sound are considered to be, I mean, so My Bloody Valentine, I heard disc uh, discussed years ago as having a feminine sound because there was a lack of chordal progression that was like language which names everything and signifies it um, and maybe genders it because of power and all of those things. Very simplistic <laughs> explanation here. Um, but we noticed there was a real absence of one of the codes of techno is a very aggressive kick drum that's very square and that your music in some ways defies that. Very wide screen, a lot of frequency modulation, pulses, clusters of sound often. Yeah, I've been guilty of the pounding kick drum for at, from time to time too, but I do get very tired of that and I feel like you can imply that pulse in so many ways and um, 
I tend to like just this sort of sub bass uh, happening without this thing that hits you over the head on every downbeat. So um, I guess I don't know if that would be considered a feminine trait or not. It's something a little, um, it's less aggressive, but when, I think when my music is aggressive, I want it to be aggressive in a kind of seductive way, not in a, a way that kind of hits you over the head, but in a way that the, the aggression creeps up on you and you don't expect it, right? So um, that's, so yeah, there's this, an element of sort of seduction um, of, of um, sort of trying to uh, just tread that threshold between pain and pleasure, like um, to like build up something slowly enough that you get to a point where it is so intense it's almost painful, but you don't really know how it got there or like um, how you ended up in that place. Right. And your body is still moving. Yeah, yeah. If, if I were to define your music in three words, it would be less is more. And I'm very curious, I mean, there's a lot of minimalism in your music and in the same way that, you know, Mills uses a lot of minimal detail to offer a maximal sort of end product. I mean, I'm curious, this kind of relationship that you say with sensuality, but also this like aggressiveness and violence, like how do you sort of balance the two when you're making music? Um, well, first of all, I, I don't know if the less is more applies that much because I tend to, I, I, I often feel like I have too many layers in my music, um, but I, I have these layers of sounds that, that kind of interact with each other, so the, the layers aren't always obvious. Um, it's not always obvious what is a separate layer because they're kind of interacting in their frequencies. And instead of having this sort of very clear bass line, synth lead, and drum, you know, snare drum here, clap here, I try and have all of those things. Um, in, it, in some ways, this is like a, a kind of a no-no in the mastering world. If you're trying to make proper techno, you, you're trying to like EQ everything so that it's very clear in the mix. And I, um, often kind of go the opposite way and I try and tune things so that they overlap with each other, but um, not in a way that turns it into just a mess, but where um, things kind of uh, fuse with each other in a strange way. It's kind of intuitive. I'm not doing it like, I, I couldn't really write a manual for how to do it. It's just a lot about listening. Um, but I do often take sort of simple starting elements and then I try and generate layers and complex material from those elements instead of just adding another layer of a different sound, another layer of a different sound and so on. I try and take the few elements that are there and generate more material from that um, through you know, effects chains and bringing things back in and having um, things sort of combined and um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, I have a, a few sort of techniques I use, but basically um, there are ways to take a few sounds and, and make a lot of material from that. Um, so there's still a connection to that original source, but you suddenly have uh, this whole set of layers that are doing different things. Are you surprised that people dance to this? Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm surprised sometimes when I can um, like start in the middle of a night and and maybe just like take it down completely to nothing and spend 10 minutes just doing sound stuff and build it up very slowly and people will be very patient and s stay with me for that journey, which is nice. And maybe we can talk a little bit about your very long history in performing electronic music live and a philosophy that you might have about what that means, what liveness means, whether there's elements of improv in, I mean, you sort of alluded to it here, in what you do and 
what is your attraction to being in that space? You could just make records. You could, you know, you don't have to go out. Well, there's a there's a real practical concern here, which is you can't, you really cannot make money from selling records anymore. You have to perform. Um, I like the energy of being in a performance, and I do like traveling and meeting people, and I like playing shows, so that's great. But I, I am at the core. I'm I am a a studio musician. I'm like I sort of painstakingly craft each track uh, with details. I don't really sort of improvise or jam them out. So um, it's, it's kind of a challenge for me to figure out how to adapt that to the live setting because everything is very studio based. And so I tend to also plan the live sets out quite meticulously. Um, I've tried different ways to improvise more and I'm not really happy with it. So, you know, I try and stick with um, what I think I do best, which is sort of planning out details and then giving myself control over a, a limited number of parameters and sort of the overall mix more in kind of the dub tradition of working the mixing console more than trying to create tracks on the fly and things like that. Um, I, I've thought a lot about what makes live electronic music and I think it's a lot more complicated than people often make it out to be like, oh, are they really playing something or not? It's like, that is a very complicated question. You know, um, what, what is happening on stage and what people are doing, like the, what makes a performance live um, has so many factors. Uh, I mean, Alvin Lussier did a performance where, uh, music for solo performer, where he sat on stage motionless with some electrodes attached to his head and they, those were connected to various instruments like drums and things on the stage. So he just sat on the stage and did not move, kept his eyes closed, but every so often like a drum would play or a cymbal would play. And um, that's an absolutely live performance in my opinion. Um, and I mean there are other, that's just like one variation of what can be a live performance, but it has a lot to do with also um, the audience, the space, how it's presented. Um, it's, it's not all about what a person is doing with their equipment or their instruments, in my opinion. Um, and it's very complicated with electronic music because it's so rare that the audience truly knows what, what is happening on stage and their conception of what they're hearing is uh, it's always compared to a recording first. They're always sort of thinking about recordings as a reference point. So we have, we're starting there from the first place with a sort of already a kind of um, one layer removed from live performance. Um, so I, I think about those things a lot. It's very complicated, but I would say um, I'm, my, my strength is not as an improviser. It's more as a composer. Uwe Schmidt said um, really recently that he, I mean, he went away from club culture and he's come back and forth. I think like even I have found some quote from you um, talking about how in 92 you had a revelation about what the promise of dance music could be, but that you really were not into it at all before. And so you seem to have an ambivalent relationship with making and being in those spaces. But he is excited about the future of dance music because of the increasing sophistication of PA systems and that the sound can turn into a kind of pure physics that then can then, because it's electronic music and the strength of it, is that it can have different bodily and psychological effects and he loves that idea. Yeah, I, I agree and so um, being able to work on this stuff on small speakers and then take it out onto these huge sound systems and and then feel what that's like is um, is amazing and I try and do things that also um, have a very physical effect and affect the body in, in you know, different ways. Yeah, I think that's true. I'm just curious if at all your background in cognitive science or even any sort of psychedelic experiences or anything maybe informed 
um, the way you design your sound, because like you said, you're quite precise in how you um, sculpt what you're doing. Yeah, it is very intuitive though. I would say that my background in cognitive science just, I, I never got very deep into the academic part of cognitive science. So the fact that I have a degree in cognitive science really just means that I'm interested in consciousness and the mind. It doesn't mean I'm an expert in any scientific discipline. So the psychedelic experience has probably shaped me more in how I um, go about finding sounds. I want to talk a, or have you talk a little bit about how the James Tenney project fits into our Rose. Uh, the R. Rose Larger project. It seems to fall a little bit outside, or is this, is she going in new places? Yeah, that's, I, it's, I, I'm hoping that opens some doorways, yeah, because um, I, I love performing that piece, and I think it, some of the stuff I talked about, about the sort of pleasure and pain threshold and the sort of gradual, gradual progression from nothing from something that is sort of quiet or simple into uh, something that's, or something that's pleasurable and um, seductive into something that's aggressive and painful. Um, that piece uh, demonstrates that perfectly. And... Um, Can you describe the piece a little bit? So uh, the piece is called Having Never Written a Note for Percussion. It was composed by um, James Tenney in 1971 just as a sort of a little diagram on a postcard. So he made a series of pieces called the Postal Pieces where they were sort of short conceptual ideas that he could fit on a postcard. And so this one just depicts um, in, in standard music notation uh, a very long crescendo from quadruple pianissimo up to quadruple fortissimo and back down to the quietest um, and at the peak, there's a, a hold symbol which says very long time. And, um, and it's for an unspecified unspec percussion instrument. It's usually performed with, with a gong or a tam-tam. And um, that's how I performed it too. So um, it's, I think it's just a, it's, the simplicity of it is so beautiful, but basically it, it's, it proves to you that there's an sort of an infinite amount of like variation and beauty uh, that happens from the quietest to the loudest point of an instrument like the gong when you play it, when you actually spend the time to sort of very gradually go from one point, from that low point to the high point. There's a whole universe of gradation there. And when you have it and you do it patiently, um, you reach that point of of piercing white noise, um, again, without really knowing how you got there. So um, it's a beautiful experience. Why perform that under our rose? You've done like the automated piano pieces under your own name. Um, well, I think it's because I, I try and achieve this kind of similar effect in, in the music I make as our rose. Um, and I also, I wanted, I mean, I see that parallel, and then I also wanted it to sort of open the door to other projects. I think people know that I'm interested in all this other music outside of techno, and I would like to give myself the opportunity to, um, you know, move in that direction for certain releases. It could perhaps call for some new outfits. Hmm. I'm, if, anyone, if anyone out there wants to uh, collaborate, send me designs or patterns. <laughs> I'm always looking for new stuff. So, should we want to open up yeah. for a question? If, if, if anyone has any questions, please don't be shy. If not, oh, yeah, you. I was wondering about your remix process, especially with the latest release on Murder, because I remember listening to it and it felt like very like, noise and all that, like, how is this going to be remixed? Is this going to be okay behind all this thing later? And then listening to your version. Songs, it's sort of like okay, it's sort of 
Wh which remix are you talking about again? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, right. Well, that that particular remix, that original of that, um, was an improvisation done with analog machines and feedback. Um, so I had to build beats around it, basically. Um, I, in that case, you know, it, it depends on the remix, um, but for that remix, I kind of built an entirely new track and used the original as a kind of essential layer of it, but I built a lot of new sounds around it. So there's no, I don't have any sort of fixed rules about how I do a remix. Sometimes I add a lot of new elements and sometimes I try and use most of the original elements depending on the material, you know, if it, um, yeah, but in that case, I, I pretty much built a new track and used the original as a layer in that. Any other questions? Don't be show, yeah. Um, well, I have two questions. Is that That's totally acceptable. Yeah. Electronic music and um, composition. Where Mills College yes. awesome. in Oakland, California. That's beautiful. And then my second question, because I'm not the internet contextual or something, but some other people. So sorry if most people know, but um, are you involved in, like, I guess, other projects that fall outside of music, like inspirations or anything? Currently, no, but I have done um, some sound installations and worked with video um, on a couple of projects in the past. Yeah. I have a question. In the time that you've been performing, um, have you, or maybe this is something that just comes later, have you, have you connected with a like-minded community? Like, have you found other people to hang out with <laughs> as a rose? Um, here they are. <laughs> <laughs> you mean, um... Do other, do drag queens come up to you? At shows? Anywhere. Well, um, I'm usually only dressed at the shows, but... But you do play some gay clubs also. Yeah, yeah. So I, I have met a few very good friends in, in London um, after playing some shows and uh, they know me both in and out of character. Um, uh, yeah, I think, well, certain people ap approach me that probably wouldn't otherwise approach me. Um, and, and things happen like uh, I have occasionally been asked to perform in, in an all-female lineup for, like recently I, I played for the Disc Woman Collective. They came through London and played and invited me to be their guest, and it was a huge honor for me. So, I mean, the fact that these things happen, um, obviously, what I'm doing, it, it, um, it helps to connect me to people who I think are doing really great things, mm -hmm. who are working outside of the sort of normative techno world, you know? So th that's a really great byproduct of, of what I'm doing here. Cool. Yes. Um, I mainly work with a computer. Um, I've worked with hardware in the past. Uh, it's partly a practical thing and partly I've just gotten really comfortable using a computer, but I, um, I don't really have a political stance on, on it. I think, um, you know, each person works differently and works well with different types of instruments, so, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, Patty, and thank you, Aros, for the talk, and thank you all for coming. I really enjoyed that. Thanks. Thank you.